to certainly share some of my background and experiences with you. I uh, had a, a great experience in working with some companies here that were founded in Santa Barbara, originally ValueClick. I joined the company here locally in 99 as a CFO and had a great experience with that organization, taking it public in 2000 and migrating through the whole dot-com uh, bust and really exiting uh, that company uh, through a period of time where we did a lot of acquisitions of public and private companies and built up about a $300 million cash position and no debt and really positioned it for continued expansion in the marketplace. Uh, from there, I went to another local company uh, by the name of FastClick, uh, another great organization filled with a lot of UCSB talent, uh, a lot of engineers there from this school. Uh, the founder, Jeff Pryor and Dave Gross were from UCSB. Uh, had a great time in that organization as well, growing it and building it and scaling that business, uh, bringing in new talent, uh, innovating further on our product offering, and uh, actually taking that company public as well in 2005. And then ironically, uh, had the opportunity to sell uh, FastClick to ValueClick, so kind of completing this small world, uh, very incestuous you know, internet industry uh, uh, situation. So. Uh, since that time, I've uh, recently launched a new company called Social Vibe. So it's an innovative way to look at how to monetize this vast growing amount of impressions within the social media world. So uh, individual profile page impressions on Facebook, MySpace, other social networks or different social communities where we have a concept of having brand advertising being invited into those experiences between consumer and consumer in a way that becomes very engaging and a natural part of that uh, conversation. So we're excited to bring that to market and scale that uh, over the next few years as well. So uh, topic of uh, my speech tonight is innovation, opportunity, and value creation. So let's get into that a bit. So when I think about innovation, I, I want to think about you know, what types of innovation are out there. And I kind of group it into two different categories. One is evolutionary innovation, and the other, which I tend to favor uh, because it's a foundation of a lot of startup companies, uh, many of which uh, you guys might aspire to be at some point in time. And that's really disruptive innovation. So evolutionary is you know, kind of the, the involvement of products or services that most companies, high-tech companies, uh, technology-based companies uh, go through as a way to further enhance their product or service, uh, keep pace with uh, competitive uh, elements within the market to extend their lead within uh, a market category, what have you. So certainly a prime example of that might be Microsoft's uh, new Vista operating system where they're trying to continue to evolve and uh, uh, move their product forward. Uh, disruptive innovation tends to break down into a couple different categories in general broad buckets. On low end, that's where you usually come to market with a cheaper offering. There might be an established player in the market that offers a, a product or service, but through a cheaper offering, you might appeal to a certain customer segment that has uh, maybe a stronger value sense, value conscious. They're not so much focused on all the uh, elements of that product that they're not going to use, they're not going to place value on, they're really looking at how can I use it in the raw basic core product. So maybe an example of that might be a, a voice over IP product. So a company like Vonage coming to market certainly is a dis disruptive or potentially disruptive player to the established uh, telephone companies. Uh, another uh, example of disruptive would be new market. So you're, you're coming out with a new product or service, something that the existing participants in that marketplace aren't providing to uh, their customer base, but certainly something that their customers want and desire and may not even know they want or desire that because the product hasn't been uh, presented before. So I kind of look at an example of that might be digital photography, where it's really been disruptive to the uh, prior players that were focused on film-based photography, digital providing a lot more convenience, lower cost, a lot more you know, uh, volume of photographs and more disposable type photography uh, as people aren't so much focused and worried about processing film costs and such. You know, I, I look at uh, how innovation is started and I've had the experience of meeting a lot of different companies, a lot of different entrepreneurs, 
And uh, it's really quite impressive and surprising that a lot of people that have really creative breakthrough ideas in some cases might be the least likely in terms of who you would expect to have those ideas. So what I like to think about is establishing a mindset of innovation. You know, we're, we're only limited by our own creativity. You know, we, we tend to maybe get conditioned or programmed in terms of the way things are, the way things always have been in a certain industry, certain products, certain experiences as consumers uh, or, or as businesses as well. Uh, but we get locked in on that kind of almost uh, compressed way of looking at things and there, there potentially can be a much broader uh, capability, a lot more uh, uh, simplicity that can be brought to market, a lot more you know, tapping into a better way of doing things through greater efficiencies and so forth. So I, I like to see or think that we all have those ideas within us. We all have uh, great concepts. It's really a matter of just kind of tapping into that and opening up our our creativity. Uh, you know, you think about the largest organizations in this world, certainly a lot of the largest organizations that have been started the last 30 years or so, you know, every one of those companies started with a thought. You know, a lot of us, you know, don't really stop to think about that. You know, we, we've always been around these companies, they've been here uh, for years, and it's just kind of accepted that, you know, they're established, but, you know, it had to start at some point in time. And I like to feel that empowerment within all of us that, hey, we all have that potential thought that could become a billion dollar idea sometime. You know, to do that, to really get into that innovative mode, you know, if you're really serious about it and you really want to come up with that great new entrepreneurial idea, I think you've got to, you know, carve out time and dedicate time to that thought process. You know, we're, we're so bombarded these days with, you know, competition for our attention, whether that's you know, in school and business, uh, with our family or friends, we're bombarded with, you know, emails, text messages, phone calls. Everywhere we're turning, there's a distraction from, you know, thinking and, and really having that quality time. So if you're really serious about being an entrepreneur and coming up with an idea, I think you've really got to schedule that time and invest in it to think <coughs> and reflect and create. You know, this is kind of in the motivational realm, uh, Continuing on here, you know, expand uh, and open your mind and awareness. You know, think outside of the box. Don't accept, you know, the traditional way of doing things as, as the way it always can be or should be done. You know, think about how you can tap into, you know, a lot of technology capabilities or a way of simplifying things. Uh, most of the most powerful, largest ideas really are some of the most simplest ideas. So. Uh, keep that in mind. You know, if you need inspiration, look at the arts, architecture, music, uh, and then certainly look at role model companies. You know, I think we're all big uh, fans of Apple, and you know, consuming their products. Like how uh, their simplicity and ease of use is, is a great uh, element and a great value proposition. Other companies, Rim, BlackBerry, Google. You know, Google's been devoting you know, billions of dollars in research and development. I think their current Monthly R&D budget, this is a huge figure, $250 million per month that they devote to research and development. You know, it's a huge expenditure. You know, they've kind of been criticized over, you know, if they're monetizing all that investment and if any of that will return, uh, uh, you know, significant returns back to the shareholders. But uh, it's pretty impressive about a company that's committed to innovation. And then certainly you can look at role model innovators, you know, Steve Jobs, Newton, Da Vinci, Edison, you know, get inspired, you know, by people that have done this before, you know, read their biographies, get inside their heads, you know, what was their personal makeup, what really enabled them to do what they do and how they did it. So there's, there's a lot of value you can get and uh, looking at people that have been successful in the past. You know, you also think about innovation and where your focus should be as, you know, an aspiring entrepreneur. You know, yeah, you could come up with an idea from a, a lot of different walks of life or a lot of different categories, a lot of different industries, but I would really focus on what is your passion? Because that's really what's going to drive you in terms of uh, devoting yourself to the process, uh, being inspired, being dedicated, committing the long, hard, uh, hours that you will have to do in order to be successful. So tap into what, what are you most passionate about? 
you know, whether it's, you know, internet advertising or the biomedical field, you know, uh, green energy, wherever it might be, you know, make sure that you're, you're spending time in an area that you're really excited about and committed for the long haul. As you identify that industry, uh, a great way to come up with potential ideas and really get your hands around what's happening and what are the pain points within in the industry is to dive in deep. So immerse yourself in the industry, look at uh, trade publications, newspapers or newsletters, uh, different reports, really try to scour that industry for information to really glean insights as a potential insider into what's happening, where the opportunities are, attend conferences. Another great uh, category that I like to tap into is public company research. Certainly you can learn a lot from annual reports, 10Ks, 10Qs, the public filings and such. I think a great area is uh, listening to the quarterly earnings calls, you know, where management presents the results of that quarter, but uh, more importantly, you get an opportunity for sharp industry analysts to dive into those results and you know, poke and prod over what's happening with the business, where it's been successful, and maybe where their shortcomings are, and where their challenges are. And through that, uh, you might find inspiration for a new idea or a new concept uh, for that industry. Uh, another area is to network and do primary research. So tap into the resources that you might have in terms of uh, your social circles, your parents' or relatives' social circles, you know, find people that might be, you know, connected as, you know, one degree separation of people that you'd like to get close to. Uh, it might be industry experts, it might be uh, company veterans, retired CEOs, retired senior management within an industry. And be creative and, and be, uh, you know, just really savvy in terms of how you make those connections and take advantage of what potentially, you know, might be available to you. You know, a lot of people get a little overwhelmed if they're thinking about a new business, uh, uh, a new innovative idea, and thinking, you know, why, why as an individual should I pursue it when companies with, like I mentioned, with Google, billions of dollars of resources behind them, why would they, why can I uh, compete against somebody like that? And I think that's where a lot of people stop in the process. Yeah, I've got a great idea, a great creative idea, but, you know, why push forward with it? only to find out later is like, yeah, I thought of that idea two years ago. Uh, companies have a certain culture and style that really starts to become a challenge in trying to, you know, come up with a, a new way of uh, doing what they currently do. Uh, a lot of the mentality might be, hey, we're already successful. We're already doing well. We've done well for the last, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. Why change? And you'd be surprised how many companies get into that comfort zone and into that mindset. And it, it starts at the top at the CEO level and runs through the ranks at every level of the organization. And, and that's where your opportunity is. I mean, you, you come up with an idea, you think there's a better way to accomplish that. Uh, you know, getting stuck in the status quo. You know, an organization, as you, you know, we all know the analogy is like, you know, the big, you know, battleship out there that has a set course and direction and has all that momentum and energy behind it going in that direction to try to turn on a dime or turn in a different direction you'd be surprised it's very similar to a company to try to get that shift where people, employees, uh, your management even, senior management is so ingrained in a certain way of thinking to get them out of that mode and shift into what other possibilities might be out there that might be even more advantageous for the company that's a real challenging thing to do. Uh, so, you know, for the individual, you know, anything's possible. Uh, companies, again, uh, management won't support me. Many, many organizations have that uh, mentality of, you know, do your job, stick to your knitting, stick to your responsibilities, and thank you very much for the idea, but we have somebody else that, that handles that area. Uh, you see that time and time again as well. Uh, it becomes very discouraging, uh, kind of, uh, taking the wind out of the cell a lot of uh, employees. So great ideas within the company oftentimes are never brought forth because they know that potential will be shot down. So you as an individual, you're empowered. You know, you have nobody to say, hey, you know, that's not going to work here. Uh, companies throw people money at a problem. Uh, that's another interesting dynamic. Even with all the 
uh, research budgets, all the facilities, all the talent, you know, PhDs, MBAs. Uh, you look at the efficiency of those organizations and what they actually produce, and it's really, really surprising. Uh, you look at a smaller, leaner, mean organization, uh, you may not have those same problems. People tend to uh, get in their own way a lot of times in terms of you know, politics coming into play, you know, people's uh, focus on their own careers, their own advancements within an organization, trying to suppress their, their teammate uh, or associate who may have a better idea but they don't want to be displaced within the organizational uh, hierarchy. You'd be amazed at uh, all the politics that go on inside an organization that, that create that kind of dynamic. So uh, maybe there are resources and maybe there are uh, you know, talent and capabilities there, but uh, perhaps there isn't the right environment to let that talent flourish. With an individual, again, you have no bureaucracy to fight and battle, so you know you got the clear runway. I uh, kind of talked about this, about companies not being able to get out of their own way. You have no roadblocks. So uh, be empowered and feel inspired and uh, passionate about your capability to come up with new ideas. And we think about opportunity, you know, it's kind of the chicken or the egg. Do you start with a great idea, with great technology in mind, with, you know, great possibility, pursue that path, and then think about, okay, how can I commercialize this later on? Or do you start with the endpoint mind say, hey, there's a big pain problem within this industry. There's you know, something that I can add value here and a real uh, defined addressable market that if I uh, come up with this solution, there's somebody waiting there to buy it and pay the right dollar amount for that. So that's, that's kind of a, a real challenge. And I, I think it's on a case-by-case -case basis. How do you assess that? You know, in an organization, uh, or certainly in a university setting, you may have a lot more resources, uh, capabilities at your disposal that you can invest in these uh, new emerging technologies and participate in that and look at commercializing it later. Or in, the case, in some cases, uh, you're not going to have that luxury. You're not going to have the resources uh, backing you. So you need to look at make sure you've got a, a, a very large pain point that you're addressing and, and the right market that's going to be able to uh, take advantage of that. You know, when we talk about the pain, uh, I think a good way to, to assess it is, you know, how big is that pain point for each individual, uh, for the company or the entity, and how big is that collectively? So one way to think about it is kind of using a medical uh, analogy. So is this a problem? Is it equal to like preventative medicine, where it's kind of a nice to have? You know, maybe it will work, maybe it will not, but you know, I, I have some kind of comfort in taking this preventative medicine. Is it more along the lines of a painkiller? Yeah, you're addressing a, a specific pain point, and yes, people are gonna reach out to you, uh, embrace your solution, because it is something that they're experiencing that they need to solve. Or is this even better, you know, kind of a, a uh, life-saving surgery or operation where, you know, without your solution, you know, the company's uh, uh, likelihood of surviving might, might be in question. You know, obviously those kind of categories you know, that extreme, our, our examples are very rare, but you know, kind of assess when you're thinking about your opportunity, you know, to what degree are you really providing value out there? Uh, the next thing to consider is market dynamics. You know, how big is the total market? Now, you may have the best idea out there, you know, the new mousetrap, better mousetrap, uh, it works, you know, fabulously better than anything out there today, but maybe the whole addressable market is only a $100 million market. Well, in a world where uh, venture capital firms and other investors are looking for uh, successful companies that have the capability of becoming $100 million in revenue in their own right, certainly that's not gonna get anybody's attention. So really focus on what is that uh, total market size. Another thing to think about is certainly what is a phase of that market, kind of you know, the life cycle of that market, if you will, is it stagnating? growing or declining. You know, obviously everybody wants to invest in markets that are growing and you know, where rising tide lifts all boats. So you know, certainly consider that element as well. Another thing to think about is, is the market slow to change where there's perhaps a lot of established players, uh, a lot of old line companies, you know, they, they do things a traditional way. 
So a new market entrant may not be embraced that well because there's deep-rooted relationships with, between company to company. Uh, new entrants uh, have a very difficult time to get any kind of traction in that kind of industry. Or is it one where it's rapidly changing? Where there's a lot of innovation, there's a lot of new companies coming in, where there's uh, very minimal or hardly any or none, uh, no barriers to entry. So anybody with maybe a PC and a great idea can come to market with a solution. You know, certainly rapidly changing uh, industries are great for creating new opportunities and, and, and accepting and embracing new solutions. But at the same time, there's risk involved there as well. Uh, you might be the, the new disruptive company on, on the block one day, only to be disrupted by another company the next. So uh, there's pros and cons of that kind of market as well. Another thing to uh, consider when you're looking at uh, a new concept and whether or not to bring that to market is what is the value to existing market competitors? Now, do you have some type of proprietary technology that uh, is unique and, and gives you kind of a, a defensible position? You know, certainly patenting what you develop is a great way to enhance your competitive position, but Today, the patent process is a lot more challenging than it was even a few years ago, where there's so much information out there, uh, so much that has been done in terms of uh, <laughs> patent activity. There's a lot of what is called prior art out there. Prior art will negate uh, your patent if uh, it's been established that it's an idea that was already out there in the public domain. So that's always a challenge, and certainly the uh, process of uh, getting patents is a bit long and arduous and the cost of defending those patents uh, can be very expensive as well. But nonetheless, you know, a good element to think about. Uh, do you have a unique solution in, that you can bring to market that perhaps may not be uh, readily replicated by the existing market uh, players? Is a, is a new uh, service, a new philosophy, a new approach that requires uh, you know, a whole new way of thinking that entrenched players, you know, again, they're so established, they're so ingrained in what they currently do that they're not going to be able to move quickly enough to uh, compete with you and therefore you become attractive to them. Uh, have you established value within a core specialty niche of that industry? You know, have you really drilled in in such a way that you have so much granular information, you have developed such a uh, an attractive and defined solution for that category uh, that the quality of service, the quality of your product is so much you know, better, far superior than what the established uh, uh, competitors or, or companies have currently offer in a way that you have that, uh, that extended advantage over them. So again, can they commit resources and, and uh, efforts behind that to match what you've been been able to develop in terms of a product or service offering, or is it more to, to their advantage to acquire you and bring you into the organization to benefit from what you've created? Uh, another uh, element is, what about their core business or, or ways that they're, or directions that they're heading into? Uh, do you have a, a new technology that can accelerate what their core initiative is? And by being able to acquire you versus build and uh, take the time and, and uh, opportunity costs of creating that internally are you a better solution for them in accelerating your business. I think uh, an example of that might be a company that was based down in Santa Monica called Applied Semantics where Google acquired them for I think it was around hundred million dollars and that became part of their core technology component for AdSense. So great example of that. You know when you think about the concept that you've developed, you know, the, this new innovative idea, you know, we really need to scrutinize what is it, and again, looking at the pain points you're solving, is it really going to provide the core foundation for a standalone business? And I think that's something that a lot of, you know, emerging entrepreneurs tend to struggle with. You know, I've, I've had the opportunity to talk to uh, a lot of individuals that come up with new ideas, uh, a lot of uh, college students that are thinking of something new and creative and, and innovative, 
And what they typically have is something very interesting, uh, very unique and different. But at the end of the day, when you look at it, is it really solving a big problem? Is it something that you could establish a whole company around? Or is it more like an enhancement of an, an existing feature, an enhancement of an existing service that really doesn't provide that, that full foundation? So you really need to you know, step back, be as objective as possible, and really try to assess that. You know, another element is, you know, are you uniquely differentiated? Again, you know, do you have something much different? Uh, it, uh, it's, it's something that's magnitudes different from what's currently in the marketplace and solves that customer's problem even more so than what's already existing today. Now, if you're talking about shades of gray between what you're coming out with or plan to come out with and what's existing today, yeah, it might be slightly better, but is it really enough? Is it really enough for uh, companies or consumers to really invest the time in what you're offering to ascertain whether or not they want to switch, whether they want to, uh, to buy your product or service? Uh, is it too much of a gray area for them? You really have to have magnitude of uh, 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 differentiation to really get that attention, to compete for that attention, and uh, to really look at something unique in, in the market, especially very crowded marketplaces which you know, the internet industry certainly has a lot of. You know, what is your defensible position? We talked about that a bit. You know, what is your proprietary product capability? Uh, maybe you have a, a unique process, something innovative, creative, that again, puts you in a better position to compete against the industry players. Maybe it gives you a, a cost advantage. Maybe you're leveraging technology to create operational efficiencies that flow down to the bottom line so you can compete uh, more head-to-head -head on a price point yet still be profitable. And then what is your unfair advantage? What is your sustainable unfair advantage? You know, for those of you who are uh, uh, Porter uh, strategy fans, you know, he talks about that a lot. Uh, what are you creating that is really going to give you that defensible position over the long haul? Uh, and that's, that's a tough question to answer, especially for a startup company where you're literally starting from ground zero. But with a lot of companies, it's you know, quality of service, you know, it's convenience, it's uh, maybe the brand. Maybe you, you have a capability of developing a brand over time that again gives you that unique brand awareness. You know, an example of that might be you know, something that has emerged on, on the scene fairly recently is Twitter. You know, maybe Twitter has some you know, emotional element, emotional aspect that people love and it's endearing to them. So they're going to use, continue to use Twitter even if uh, another company came along the lines and offered that, that type of communication capability. Uh, as you're going through this assessment process, really tap into uh, the professionals that you can have a relationship with to really use as a sounding board. Uh, it might be your university professors, it might be local business professionals, it might be uh, your uh, uh, attorney, family attorney, corporate attorney, uh, accountants, whoever you know that has experience advising companies that have gone through what you potentially could be going through before, has some basis of knowledge to really say, hey, that's a great idea, I think you're onto something, but here's how you might consider it and change it and, and uh, modify it. Or you want somebody that's going to be able to give you the, you know, straight from the gut response, uh, very candid with you, uh, that, that may say, hey, this is not going to work, but might give you feedback in a way where you can go out and modify your idea, modify your concept in a way that will work based on some of that feedback. You know, an even greater way to accomplish that is to go to your target market. You know, if you have connections within that industry that you're providing a solution for, you know, seek out those people. Uh, you know, again, tapping into your network, into you know people that can make that kind of introduction for you, to sit down with them and actually share share that concept. You know, how does that resonate with them? Is this something unique out there, or have you seen a number of companies that provide something similar? Uh, you know, if you were to uh, have a solution like this available to you, what is the value of that to you? Is it, is it something you're going to be willing to apply part of your budget towards or you know, is it one of those kind of nice to have but not necessarily need to have 
type of solutions. So really tap into that, uh, that targeted market before you spend a lot of time, energy, resources, and potentially money trying to develop and foster your idea. You know, when you're, you've gone through that process and you feel confident about what you've done, you, what you've created so far, you're ready to go to market, ready to, you know, uh, fulfill those entrepreneurial dreams. You know, now it's what I call gut check time. You know, there are a lot of different personalities in the world. A lot of different people are, are kind of cut out to be an entrepreneur. And you've got to take a hard look in the mirror to say, am I one of those people? You know, am I willing to make the sacrifices that I'm going to need to make over what is probably going to be a five to seven year period before I see the end result I'm looking for, and am I willing to go down that path? You know, am I willing to sacrifice friends, potentially sacrifice family, certainly sacrifice you know, maybe uh, economic uh, aspects of my life? Am I willing to take on this endeavor where my buddies are taking you know, attractive job offerings uh, next uh, graduation date, and I'm, I'm going to focus on my dream here? So, you really need to, to take some time, uh, and if you're not sure, uh, maybe that's telling you something. But it's also good as, as you go through that self-assessment process to talk to other successful entrepreneurs. Talk to, even more importantly, people that tried to start a new business but failed for whatever reason. And you really get you know, an inside look into, in terms of you know, what am I about to go through? What, what kind of... Uh, you know, valley am I leaping into blindly without really knowing what lies ahead of me. So you really want to do your homework. Another thing I would suggest is, you know, considering taking on a partner as opposed to going at this alone. You know, I, I look at a lot of companies that have been successful and, and there's a, a common thread there. It's usually they were started by at least two co-founders, maybe three. And, and I like to think of that as kind of, you know, the, some of the buddy system or the workout partner. Uh, where you know some days it's going to be tough, it's going to be grueling, you know it's, it's not good news you're hearing every day. You know you, you might be experiencing rejection after rejection from financing sources, from potential customers, uh, people you're trying to make connections with. You need somebody to to help you in that process. I think two people going out together can provide a great amount of support, a great amount of uh, opportunity to bounce ideas off each other. Hey, are we doing the right thing here? Are we taking the right approach? There's a lot of synergy that can take place in business planning as well, uh, where you, you start to collaborate and you start to come up with maybe a, a better way, a better approach, you know, resetting your game plan and coming up with uh, another way to tackle what you're trying to accomplish. So I think that's big, you know. But at the same time, obviously as, as a partner going into this, you almost have to think of this like a marriage. You don't want to just grab anybody that shows an interest in what you're doing, but really vet out, is that the right person? Is that the right person I'm going to be able to spend 24-7 you know, with? Is this somebody reliable, trustworthy, that you know, brings not just effort to the table, but there's a lot of value to the table? Maybe there's a way uh, that person compliments me in, in terms of the skills he or she might have compared to what I have. So think long and hard about that. You know, Another element is look at adjusting your lifestyle. And maybe this isn't so much of a big deal for, for somebody in the, in the college years, but uh, that certainly speaks to why a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of successful entrepreneurs are in their, their younger 20s because they don't have the economic commitments, financial commitments of somebody that might be a bit older. So, but nonetheless, you know, how can you get prepared for the lean, mean years? You know, how can you cut your costs to the bone and you know, maybe move back into the parents' house to uh, keep those costs down while you're pursuing your dream. Plus you get that extra support as well. So uh, establish your support system. You know, again, what kind of uh, professionals can you tap into? What kind of uh, entrepreneurs can you uh, be able to lean on, tap into, uh, provide that additional advice? When the going gets tough, you've got people you can rely on and, and lean on to help you through that, those challenging times. So as you, you kick off your, your venture in, in terms of this path to value creation, uh, you start with building your foundation. 
Uh, certainly, I think developing your business plan is, you know, people always ask, you know, do I really need to go through and develop my, you know, 40, 50, 60 page business plan before I come to market? Isn't, isn't a PowerPoint good enough? Uh, great question. I think the environment is such today that the bar has really been raised much higher. Certainly if you're talking to traditional venture capital resources, if you're a young emerging entrepreneur without a track record, you haven't done this before, this is a whole new, new experience for you, I think you've got to demonstrate some capability, you know what you're talking about, and a solid, well thought through business plan is going to help demonstrate and give you that extra validation uh, that that you've thought this through and that you're a bankable professional, let's say, that people are going to trust by because you have put that thought and effort into it. Another thing to really consider is designing the financial model for this new business. You know, we talk about uh, you know, Web 2.0. So many companies out there came to the market, great idea, great way to tap into the Internet's social capabilities and new creative, innovative ways and ideas. How are they going to monetize that, right? How have they created a, a you know, solid, functional business model? So I think that's something you need to think about up front, you know, definitely, because you're going to need certainly financial projections and such to get support uh, from investors and interest from investors. But think about really how am I designing this for the long haul? Uh, some companies get entrenched and in, in potentially trapped into a certain financial model where they've committed to giving a certain percentage of revenue to through their partners, business development partners or certain uh, suppliers and such that to try to shift away from that model down the road uh, when they're looking to create more profitability to make their company look more attractive, uh, potentially take the company public, they get locked in. And once you have a few years of conditioned experience with your suppliers or partners where they're expecting a certain you know, economic return tied into your revenue, it really becomes very, very difficult, extremely hard to uh, uh, unwind that uh, years of experience. So think about your model and how you're designing it. You know, is it going to be certainly R&D intensive, capital intensive? Is it going to be uh, a model that requires a high level of service? So factor that in, or is it something um, you know that's going to take a long sales cycle? And maybe it's a, a larger, big ticket item, something that's it's a lot more technical in terms of the sales process, and it's just going to take uh, a longer period of time. So you got to think about all those elements. Again, go back to the public companies, go back to professional advisors that can really assist you and help you kind of navigate through that process. Another thing to Factor in is the company structure and, and organization. Certainly you want to work with uh, an attorney that's experienced in this area, going through uh, helping companies get established and set up and doing it the right way. So down the road you're not unwinding mistakes and correcting mistakes that are challenging or maybe impossible to correct. Uh, think about your capital structure in terms of how much you're, you're looking to certainly give to new investors, how much you're willing to allocate uh, to fellow employees, to perhaps co-founders, or uh, to employees as you bring them on board and grow the company in the form of stock options. So again, internet's a great resource for that, and there's a lot of uh, private, company, uh, private and public company comps that you can start to, to look at for guidance in that area. Uh, this is a big deal in, in my book, uh, getting your professionals lined up. Again, whether that's your attorney, your accountant, your banker, you want to have those type of professionals in place. You also want to make sure that they're experienced in what they do in terms of helping uh, startup companies, <clears throat> emerging growing companies, uh, that they've been there, done that. You know, every attorney or every accountant isn't going to just be good enough for you. You want to make sure you're working with somebody that, that has experience in a startup uh, environment. And then lastly on this is building your board of directors. Uh, this is something that you really want to uh, think about strongly and take your time and really think about what are the needs that you have as an entrepreneur to build out that level of expertise that is really going to put you in the best position, put you into uh, 
a situation where you can tap into experience of people that have been there and done that before, or they have specific industry experience, or they have experience you know, growing successful companies, they have experience going through market ups and downs and expansion, contractions. Uh, but think long and hard about that. You know, the board position is something you just don't take lightly in you know, maybe, you know, Uncle Bob has some great experience, but, you know, he may not necessarily be the guy that you want on board in the long haul. You know, example is uh, our company uh, today, Social Vibe, we've gone through uh, a fund uh, raising process. We brought on venture capital money in a Series A offering, and we allocated five board seats for our company in that process. Uh, today, we only have four of those positions filled, again, because we don't want to rush to bring somebody in that may not provide the right value for the long haul. So we're being very, very selective, very, very picky about who we're gonna bring on board because that's, that's something that you're probably gonna have to live with for quite some time. Here's a fun one today, uh, today's environment, the, the funding process, you know. Yeah, if you look out today what's going on with the credit markets, you know, every financial institution, that's had uh, ripple effects certainly through to uh, you know friends and family you know who doesn't have a, a family member or friend or yourself that has been impacted with your stock portfolio bond portfolio uh, the home value the equity uh, that you may have or friends and family may have is evaporated uh, so that that source might be gone today you know we'll come back in in time perhaps uh, uh, for the next six to 12 months? Probably not. Uh, angel investors are, are equally hit. You know, uh, angel investors tend to be you know, pretty aggressive with their dollars and you know, have the you know, fortuitous position to do so. But you know, everybody's been impacted. Nobody has been insulated from what's going on in the markets and, and with uh, private companies as well if they've been active investors. Uh, looking at venture capital firms, uh, right now is probably the toughest time to go out there and raise capital. And I'm speaking from experience. I'm looking to, to raise another round of capital for our company. Uh, you know, VCs are nervous. Uh, they, one, have their uh, portfolio of existing companies that they've certainly backed and are committed to and, and uh, focus on ushering through uh, to see them reach break even and profitability and exit. But uh, they don't know what the success is going to be in this challenging economic environment for those companies. So the uh, ability to look at new opportunities is certainly uh, is a strain right now. Uh, when you look at you know what are their sources of capital and availability, you know they they've gone out and they've raised their various rounds and maybe some have been very lucky in raising uh, rounds before the this whole uh, market correction took place but they're looking at their powder. You know, they have to keep their powder dry for a number of years because they're in the same boat. They're looking to uh, raise money at some future point in time for another fund as well, so they gotta make the capital that they have today survive and, and be uh, able to provide them their own livelihood for a period of time until they can go back to market and access uh, capital out there as well. So, am I saying it's impossible? No, it's not impossible. If you've got a great idea, if you have you know, a, a great concept that provides a solution to a big pain point, you, know, you still have a shot. But you know, the bar has been raised dramatically. In terms of uh, other possibilities, you, you can look at certainly government grants might be a, a possibility. This is an area that I'm not really familiar with, but in the university setting, there might be opportunities. And then look at technology commercialization programs. You know, perhaps uh, you know, there's uh, a way to tap into that, look at the university resources where you can uh, devote your, your intellectual know-how or capabilities to, to potentially commercialize a project that emerges from the university setting. Again, not my area of expertise, but certainly one that uh, uh, for people here at, at this university you might look into. As you look at growing your company, uh, and coming out, the big important thing very early on is to get that market validation. You want to be able to go out and show that there are actually paying customers out there 
They're going to pay attractively for what you're bringing to the market and prove that you have something of value. It's, not, it's no longer just a concept. It's no longer just a, uh, a neat idea. It's something that you know, people are, and either consumers or businesses really see as, as true, truly valuable. Uh, another element, keep lean and mean. Just because you may have those first initial signs of success, you know, you got your funding, you have new customers coming in, you know, don't expect that to always continue. And it's not, not a graph that always goes up and to the right uh, continuously. Expect and plan for the downturns. Expect and plan for the challenges of trying to reach other, other uh, potential consumers or target customers in your market. It's, it's, it's really challenging and you gotta keep, again, keep your powder dry. Uh, another aspect is hire the best talent possible and really, truly scrutinize who you're bringing on board at every single position. You want to be able to uh, look at potential people you're bringing on board. What specific value are they providing? What specific, or specific expertise? Maybe they may, might be you know, your, your roommate's best friend and he's got you know, a lot of enthusiasm he's showing for your company, your idea, wants to join, wants to be part of uh, you know, the success story, but you know, scrutinize that person. You gotta step back, be objective, you know, eliminate any kind of personal feelings and say, is this truly somebody that's gonna add value to my organization? Another aspect here is, is hook your star to a big player. And what I mean by that is similar to uh, getting validation within the marketplace early, try to get your validation from the biggest players in that market. Now, our company, for example, we have a brand advertising solution. So one of our first customers was Coca-Cola. You know, we thought, you know, what a better brand, or could there even be a better brand, world-renowned brand that can help us get market validation out there? Hey, Coke's, Coke's uh, getting great success, getting great marketing ROI from our solution. You know, wouldn't you like to experience that as well? That, that says volumes about that. Big players have big budgets. If they like you, they, you develop that partnership, you develop that high level of quality service, they're gonna bring you in and try to spend more money with you if you truly are providing that solution in a way that makes them you know, more profitable, more efficient, uh, and a better organization themselves. As you go along with your business, you constantly have to have a mindset of scrutinizing and assessing everything you're doing, whether it's from the core original business model, your value proposition, how the markets have changed, how your customers have changed, what are the drivers of your customer's business. You know, look online down, down the value chain, be aware of what's happening, what's transpiring within that industry that you're trying to serve. How are you uh, providing the best possible solution to that market? You know, are, do you really need to take a hard look at what you're offering is it okay? Is it something that's embraced? But to what degree? You know, do you really need to raise the bar even higher than what you originally expected to get the traction, get the growth that, that you were trying to achieve? Uh, this is certainly a big one, execution. You know, a lot of companies have great ideas, a lot of people have great ideas, a lot of companies out there uh, with you know, passion employees, uh, effective employees, but unless they're truly, truly focused in on specific deliverables, specific uh, levels of contribution and accountability, you're really not going to be able to move fast enough. You're really not going to be able to uh, execute fast enough. So creating an organization, a cultural environment of intense execution is key. You know, in the kind of industry I'm in, in, internet advertising, again, I talked about companies that move fast, or industries that move fast, and are always sus suspect to change. You know, you gotta be nimble, quick, and execute rapidly. If not, you're gonna be displaced before you know it. So execute, execute, execute. And then the last one on here, always be fundraising. Uh, you gotta be prepared. You never know when you're gonna hit the downturns. You never know when you're, you're uh, needs to access capital is going to emerge. Uh, you got to be prepared. You got to have your house in order, your financial statements in order. You got to have your your team in order, your business plan. You have to have your metrics. Every new company should have metrics that they're tracking, they're monitoring, and they're measuring against to demonstrate 
what, what you're doing as a company, how you're creating value, and are you or are you not on the right track and growing in the direction that you'd like to grow. So be prepared and always have that mindset of always be fundraising. This kind of my favorite slide, uh, engineering for the payday. Uh, you know, certainly we, there are different exits available to companies, you know, an IPO versus an outright sell of the company. You know, <laughs> being someone who's gone through two IPOs uh, and the process that that entails, especially now with Sarbanes-Oxley requirements and for a small company that has to address that overwhelming challenge to, to have that, uh, that box checked, if you will, to become a public company, not easy. And obviously today, given where the credit markets are at uh, and where they have been for, for small companies over the past you know, two to three years, you know, that opportunity has kind of played out. It's a much different environment. You know, will the IPO markets ever come back? Perhaps, you know, if we have a new administration now, uh, will they make it uh, a lot easier for private companies to access public capital and maybe, you know, pull back on what a lot of people view as kind of going to the extreme? Uh, perhaps that could be uh, the case, but, you know, I wouldn't really be betting on it. Uh, we think about timing of an exit. Uh, I've had, again, the chance to see through companies I work with in our industry or uh, just friends of mine who are CEOs of their own companies that they founded. And you often see guys or, or gals in positions of leadership that are doing quite well, that have a growing company, growing revenues, growing profitability, everything's you know, aligned, uh, creating greater and greater value. And the challenge is, you know, shifting to a point to say, now it's time to sell. Most of the people ride that wave up and ride that wave back down and miss that opportunity. And, and I think a good rule of thumb is, you know, probably the best time to sell or considering an exit and selling your company is probably the time when you least would like to do that because things are going so well. So that's, that's kind of an indicator that, uh, you know, you should really think long and hard, you know, is the timing uh, right to do that because you know things are always sus suspect to change and nothing is ever constant and up and to the right, as I say. So to prepare for that, you know, is your house in order? Do you have again audited financials? Do you have your metrics? Do you have all all the uh, kind of housekeeping elements in order? All your employment agreements, all your stock option agreements, all the things that you could think of in a possible due diligence list. Uh, that a competitor or potential acquirer may want. You know, make sure you've got that buttoned up and taken care of, because to do it at the last second, it's almost an impossible task. Uh, when you're thinking about selling a company, you always should have representation. I don't care how small you are or how big you are. If you are still a small size company that may not get the attention of uh, one of the large uh, national, international investment bankers or even a regional local investment bank still have representation, still have an attorney involved in that process. Uh, they can negotiate on your behalf. They can look at details about that transaction you're not going to be aware of that if you don't, in hindsight, those, those little details could come up to, to blindside you. You don't want to be that, in that position. You don't want to be thinking you're getting one thing out of the deal, yet the legal documents uh, are created to generate something else, whether that's you know any kind of pullback provisions, carve-outs, any kind of way that the acquirer can take money back from what you thought you were selling that company for. So make sure you have that representation uh, in that process. And then in terms of maximizing value for a company, you know, focus on excellence. You know, in every aspect of your business from you know, the receptionist all the way through to your product going out the back door. Uh, you want to make sure that you've done your job as a leader of that organization to make sure that to the best degree possible, you've addressed all aspects of your company and, and really make it a true world-class organization. You don't want a potential acquirer to come in and see that you've fallen short in a certain way and get spooked by that and uh, pull back. Uh, you, you want to make sure that what you have is quality and that good companies, certainly companies with deep pockets, are going to pay for that quality. And hopefully it's the right environment 
uh, where there, you're going to have multiple uh, competing bids to acquire that quality organization you've built. You know, I talked a little bit about you know, the challenging market that we're in right now and going through the challenges of fundraising. You know, why would you consider doing a startup today? Uh, you know, certainly not the best, most favorable environment. The landscape looks pretty bleak out there right now. But you know what? Some of the best companies and most successful companies have been created in the most dire markets. You know, certainly the obvious uh, factor in that, it clears out all the, the competition. You know, companies that are out there creating noise, you know, getting, you know, share of mind from your targeted customers, you know, creating confusion over what is their value proposition versus your value proposition, a lot of that goes away in a down market when those companies aren't around anymore. You also have, starting now, you kind of have the, what I call the armchair advantage, kind of as an armchair quarterback. You can look at what companies were successful, which were not, of those that were not, you know, what caused them to fail. You know, was there a flaw in their, their business offering? Did they not think through what their monetization strategy was for the business? Were they banking on a we'll build it and they will come type approach and really have no true you know, base of business there? So it gives you advantage of, of seeing what worked and what didn't uh, and modifying that to your advantage. Another element is access to talent. Great markets are great, but I gotta tell you, trying to grow a company and get the access to talent that you're really looking for to make it successful, super, super tough. Uh, you've, you've got uh, people that in a normal economic environment, you know, might be <coughs> making fifty to sixty thousand dollars, all of a sudden their offers in the market are double that because companies are so desperate to bring in talent to scale and grow their business. When you're paying, you know, two X the salary and comp package for talent uh, that you really need, it becomes pretty painful. It doesn't really stretch those startup dollars that far. So, you know, lean, lean times create greater access to talent, bring on better talent, better access to talent, that, that works to your advantage. Also, leaner times create, you know, better business decisions. You think long and hard about, you know, making that expansion decision, hiring that employee, you know, creating that new uh, product extension uh, when times are tough and capital has gone a long ways. Then also, uh, slower industry pace. You know, we call, talked about that disruptive, uh, innovative environment. In a slower environment, you don't have to keep pace that fast. You can take your time, but that doesn't mean you move slow. You still got to execute, move quick, but you have a little bit of a luxury of taking your time to make sure you're making the right decisions. And then certainly, starting a company now, a good time, uh, the economy is going to return, you know, the markets will come back, industries will start to grow again at attractive rates, and you want to be positioned when that does happen to be a successful, you know, company in that industry, and you're going to look really, really attractive for companies that are, again, once again, on the acquisition hunt and trying to grow and scale their business, so. So, that's kind of uh, a nutshell of my experiences, and uh, a little bit of uh, knowledge I can share with you. Now, entrepreneurship is not for everybody, but you know, if you're gonna take on, on that challenge, go down that path, just make it a fun, enjoyable journey and get the most out of it and appreciate all the knowledge and experience you're gaining in that process. So I wanna thank you for the opportunity tonight.